he didn't live in the rectory. He just lived in that little loft, and he slept on a, a little, like a day bed for years. He didn't eat meat for 45 years, or most, more than that by the time he died. And um, um, he never had a housekeeper. Just did everything, took, every, took care of everything himself. But um, what I want to say. He was ordained on uh, July 6, 1913. And his first mass was celebrated in Rome on July the 7th, in 1913. After Father McNamara completed his studies in Rome, he returned to the Diocese of Chicago. And in 1928, Father McNamara was given St. Adrian's Parish in the south side of Chicago, where he established and built a beautiful church and school. Father remained at St. Adrian's Parish until he died on October the 26th, 1973. Father McNamara, until death, held firm and steadfast to his beloved church. He was, all, he was always faithful to his priestly vows and his blessed mass, despite the trials and sufferings it brought. His example, of course, to hold on to the truth despite all opposition, has been a lifelong, a lifeline for those who knew him and those who prayed to him. He taught us how to live in these days of darkness, and we are truly greatly grateful to the saintly priest. Um, I'm trying to find the place where our Lord said to him, "When you speak for when you when you speak for me, I will answer for thee." That's the part I was trying to find. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But I want. Yeah. He, uh, he was, um, first of all, he had a crucifix that um, bled 13 times, 12 times. And it first bled in 19... The first time uh, Father McNamara's crucifix bled was September the 17th, 1937. And the last time it bled was in 1941. The first time that he that the crucifix bled from the five holy wounds was while he was blessing Sacred Heart badges, and he used to get barrels and barrels of uh, badges and continued to bless them. And many, many, many beautiful stories and miracles were to come out of them. Um, yeah, um, they all. Pardon me. My notes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I've got a flock of them. Um, his, his bleeding crucifix bled profusely, and the corpus became life-size and sat on the edge of Father Mac's bed and said to him that seeing was believing. He said, I put you to a test. Father um, told me, and he told many other people, that it was the little flower who was instrumental in changing his life. For um, many years, he and a group of his uh, fellow priest friends, they were gourmet crooks, and they would go from one parish to another, and each, pardon me, going from one parish to the other, uh, with their culinary, with the professing, you know, doing their gourmet cooking. And uh, this one uh, Saturday night, uh, a priest was going to pick Father McNamara up, and, and the little flower of Jesus appeared to Father McNamara. And she laid before him his life, and she said, what a waste. And when this priest arrived, he immediately understood. And uh, when this priest arrived, he said, Father, I'm sorry. He said, I'm not going with you tonight. And he said, and I'll be, I'll be out of the group of the, of the cooking. But they call themselves the gourmet cooks. And um, Father always spoke to us and to anyone that ever was in his presence about accepting simple abandonment and uh, uh, getting in regard to his crucifix um, of course the church has the right when when these things happen to be absolutely sure about it but he certainly was went through the uh, the mill with the persecution from Cody all the way down to everybody in fact I know a priest who uh, was a missionary priest and he traveled 
He was asked uh, by different people if they had known Father McNamara, and he made it his business at a particular time to go and visit Father McNamara. And when he arrived there, Father was not in. And uh, so he went over to the parish house, and uh, they had him stay overnight. And in the morning, the priests weren't around to ask him if he needed any breakfast or anything. But a janitor came along, and he said to him, uh, uh, who are you looking for? And he said, oh, I come here to, to see Father McNamara and his, you know what he said to him? That clown? They really, they really, they almost put him in shackles. In fact, that was part of the attempt because they didn't, they disbelieved so many of the things that had happened. And finally, with all the persecution that went on about the bleeding crucifix, first of all, when the crucifix bled, Father himself thought, well, this could be the work of the evil one. And when it happened again, he didn't say anything, and it happened three and four and five and six times. So finally, he did. He, he reported it to uh, the higher authority, and uh, so they kept uh, a vigilance on him with their private uh, FBI. Finally, um, there was a nun on the far north side of Chicago, which was in maybe about I'd say 25 miles from where Father's parish was. And she called, uh, the, the, uh, he got the call that she wanted to see him. She, this nun was in bed, seriously ill. And when Father arrived there, the nun said, Father, where is the crucifix? And he said, no one told me that you wanted the crucifix. So he went all the way back, drove all the way back to his parish. And she said, I must have the crucifix. So she, he brought the crucifix. And when he brought it back, in the meantime, they alerted. Uh, Cody and they got they had their henchmen there to observe because they were just dying to find out well this is another one of his trips nothing's going to happen so they were there to witness this and that's what was positive proof that Father Mac's crucifix truly bled and when he brought the crucifix back she said now Father you must leave it with me and he understood because evidently Christ had told him about this oh. told the nun yes so he left the crucifix with the nun. And um, uh, as she was holding the crucifix, like in such, above her, and venerating and, you know, looking at Christ, it bled profusely. And she had, she was in a bed with her. She had a white uh, spread on top of her. And the spread was drenched with the blood that came from the crucifix. But this was after many, many years of torture and, and heartaches and trouble. Another time, Father McNamara was um, in the hospital. And... Uh, Christ became alive on the crucifix to him. And the, the doctor that he had, he, was, he thought it was his friend, and he told him about it. And this doctor, in turn, called the, uh, the chancery office, called the uh, Cody, and the priest that happened to answer the telephone got the message, and he was to deliver it to Cody. In the meantime, he called Father McNamara, called the hospital, and was put through. And he said, Father... You better be prepared for an investigation. So, um, what they were trying to do was to prove, they were trying to prove that Father was, that he wasn't have his faculties, you know, that he was sick. And, um, so they, um, oh, anyhow, uh, this, uh, person that was in the Chancery office said if I, when he advised them, I told him he was going to, there was going to be an investigation. And, uh, so Father then knew, what he had to do. So he went to a, a Jewish uh, specialist, he went to a Protestant specialist, a doctor, and to a Catholic, and he had three physical, complete physicals, and, and got the affidavits, and he had a tiny little safe in his office, <laughs> it was, the door was open on it, but uh, one day he did not come to the door, and Father went to the door, and here was his two big burly men there. They were priests, and uh, when they came in, they said, Father, would you come with us? And he turned around. Now, Father Mac told this to me himself. If I heard it from someone else, I'd say, well, maybe they, you know, did this or they had whitewashed it. He said, so I turned around, and he said, I just opened the door, and I turned around, and I said, here, boys, is this what you're looking for? And that was the absolute, and that was another proof. That <laughs> the three affidavits, Frank, he went through three... They were going to take him. They were going to take him, put him in shackles. Sure. Yeah. They were trying to prove that he was. Well, 
Well, they, they, they were trying to prove that, um, that he was imagining this. You know, that it, uh, that he was, that he was, that he wasn't, that, that he, had, he was perfect in health and his sanity. That there was nothing, uh, no hallucinations and no reason for them to, um, misjudge, you know, his uh, physical or his sanity.